Welcome to the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, Stephen F. Udvarhazy Center, located at Dulles International Airport near Washington, D.C. Hi, I'm Jack Daly, director of the museum, and it's my pleasure to welcome you back for another exciting aviation adventure. You may recall on our last visit, we focused on the Wright brothers and their invention of the aircraft and its impact on our lives. Today, we've picked eight other aircraft that played important roles in our development during the first 100 years of flight. So fasten your seat belts and let's get going. Hello America, I am Andrew McClellan, one of the aerospace educators here at the National Air and Space Museum Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center and it is my pleasure to welcome you to America's Hangar. Let's first begin by introducing you to a couple of our airplane experts here. Well, let's start with Kelsey and Dylan. Hi, I'm Kelsey Carr and I live in Muncie, Indiana and I go to Burris Laboratory School. Hi, I'm Dylan Howard and I go to Burris and I live in Muncie, Indiana. And like I said, I'm one of three aerospace educators. And so here we have Margie and Christine, the other two. Hi, I'm Christine Hunt. I'm the aerospace educator in residence from the Potomac School in McLean, Virginia. Hi, I'm Margie Natalie, and I'm the aerospace educator from Fairfax County Public Schools. Now, we are inside the Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center, but we're also in a very special area, a classroom. And I want to introduce the special guests we have today from local area schools here in Northern Virginia. And let's start with the students from Harper Park Middle School in Loudoun County, Virginia. And we're also joined by the schools from Rachel Carson Middle School in Fairfax, Virginia. And last but not least, the Potomac School in McLean. Very good. And so now it is time for our very first episode of Wheel of Airplanes. What we're doing here is choosing one of our two competitors that are going to race on the screens for you. And you guys can do this in your classroom too. And the first competitor is the Boeing B-29. Very good. Oh yeah, it's a good one. And the second airplane that is going to race today, let's hope it's on the opposite team. Come on, Red. Come on, Red. Yes, it's the Winnie Mae. Oh, we like the B-29, huh? Okay, it's an early favorite. Let's see how it turns out. Oh, we have a choice here. Do we want to go to Seattle or to Washington? Washington. Washington, all right. So we're going to take off from, oh, Yes, yeah, Seattle, Washington. Take off from Tampa, Florida. 
Very good, Christine. Right, and they've uh, they've taken off. The Winnie Mae could take off from a grass field. Uh, the B29 definitely has to have a, a concrete strip. Uh, the uh, B29 is going at nearly 350 miles an hour, still slower than most commercial uh, airplanes, and the Winnie Mae at about 180 miles an hour. We're in Seattle, and the Winnie Mae must be nearly halfway there. All righty. Now, it's obvious the B-29 is the winner in about eight hours. Pretty nice. And so now it is time to move on to another part of the museum, and we're going to be meeting a man by the name of Blake Reed. Blake, you're clear for takeoff. Hey everybody, we are here in the Eud Farhazi Center. Thank you for coming. And in case you, you joined us last time in October, you may remember me, it's me, Blake, and I'm here with Vivian. How you doing, Vivian? Very good, and you? Good, still good, still good <laughs> since last October. And I do want to remind you that we are live. Live means that you can call us. There's an 800 number on your screen. Look at that, call it, it's a free call. Also, in case you don't have a phone, you can email us. Email is also free, there's no reason not to. So go ahead, send us your questions because during the show, we have a bank of experts that's going to be taking those questions. And if you send us a really good one, then we will take the questions on the air. So Vivian, that's what we're doing live. But what's that you're holding? Um, it's a passport for if you can, follow, you can follow, use it to follow along with the show. Yeah, so if you've printed out your passport, take those out because we'll be using those for the whole show. Because today we've got eight planes, eight planes out of the 80 that are already hanging in this hangar. And we'll be using those throughout, right? But let's take a look back to October, right? Last October, some of you did join us for our first electronic field trip in the series on the Wright Flyer. Hey, Vivian, have you ever been to the Air and Space Museum downtown? Yep, yeah? many times. What's your favorite part? The space. The space, the, air, the, the space part, right. But like what we were doing in October was all about the Wright brothers, Wilbur and Orville Wright. And it's amazing to think that from the Wright brothers to space, which is your favorite, like it only took about 60 years, which is less than an average lifetime. It's amazing when you think about it, right. So, but let's start our let's start our show and like and first off, let's talk to Raquel and Raquel's going to show us a little bit about the Cadrone, our first airplane. Raquel, what can you tell us? Hi, I'm Raquel Adaman, and I'm doing the Cadrone G4. The wingspan of the Cadrone G4 is 56 feet, the length 24 feet, and the height 9 feet. Now let's take a closer look at the Cadrone. Hi again, we're back here at the Cadrone, and this time I have Ken Roberts, a senior docent at the center, and he's going to tell us a little bit about the Cadrone. Thanks, Raquel. That was a really nice introduction, and uh, you've given us a good first look at the Cadrone. So let's look at some of the features of it. Uh, first of all, the Cadrone was uh, designed and built by two French brothers, Rene and Gaston Cadrone, and they modified an earlier airplane they had that had a single engine and put on two, two engines. And this was the first twin engine French military airplane. Uh, now, they made three different versions, a reconnaissance version, a bomber version, and a trainer version. But back in World War I, the most important thing that airplanes could do was reconnaissance. Now, can you tell us what reconnaissance means? Well, this plane was used for a World War I spy over enemy, li enemy lines. That's right. They'd fly over enemy lines, and the observer would take, either use a camera and take pictures or make sketches, or sometimes use a radio to radio back what he was seeing. Now, this, uh, the crew sat in this central pod here, which is called a nacelle, and uh, unusually the pilot sat in the back. It's kind of like driving a car from the rear seat. 
<laughs> Sounds kind of funny, doesn't it? And the observer sat up front here, and you know he's supposed to be looking at the uh, enemy and taking pictures and everything, but he's got a machine gun up there. What do you think that's for? That's for protecting the plane just in case the enemy spies or sees you. Right, if enemy planes come up and try to shoot you down, because they don't want you to get that information. He actually has two guns. He's got this one gun in the front, and it's kind of stored right now, but when he's using it, it runs in the central track right down here, and it's pointing forward, and it can only run up and down in the track, because see how close the tips of the prop are to the, uh, to the gun? If he had that gun sticking out and he tried to move it side to side, he'd stick the barrel in the props, and that would make a big noise and startle the pilot. You don't want to do that. And what else does he have to be careful about because of that? He doesn't want to stick his head or any limbs out of the cockpit because they might get, he might want pull, pull back a lot. Right, yeah. If he went, look at that, he'd get his fingernails trip, trimmed right up to his elbow, and that's not good. And he had a rear gun uh, in case they came in from the back but he had to fire it over the pilot's head, which wasn't really good either. Now, I understand you might have some questions for me. What? Yes. Um, why does the Cadrone have such a long wingspan? Why does the Cadrone have such a long wingspan? Well, mainly for lift. You've, you've got heavy engines and a two-man crew, so you have to have uh, pretty long wings to carry that load. Okay. Um, and if you, if you come back here and look a little bit at the wings, since we're talking about those, uh, you notice the wings are kind of thin, and uh, they're kind of flimsy, so they have to be braced with these struts and these wires. And when you put it all together, it's still lightweight, but that's with all that bracing, it's a good sturdy structure. It's kind of like a bridge that you might have seen when you drive over and it's got all those supports in it. And a couple of other things while we're looking at the wings. First of all, the fabric is the original fabric that was put on this airplane in 1916. So this fabric is almost 90 years old. Wow. Pretty good for linen, isn't it? Yeah. And another thing they did with it is, uh, if you look out here, uh, right there, you can see that there are what look like shoelaces on the wing. And that looks really strange way to build a wing, doesn't it? Yeah. But uh, that's because this airplane used an old style of control called wing warping. and. Uh, if you remember, uh, that's what the Wright brothers used to control their airplane, too. So the outboard parts had to be flexible so that they could warp and move better and uh, make it easier to control. All right. Yeah. I have another question. Okay. Do you think the Cadrone is a good example for a World War I airplane? Uh, yes, the Cadrone is a good example of an early World War I airplane. As the uh, war went on, the airplanes got more sleek looking and more streamlined because there was a lot of development work going on. So a, a lot of work got compressed into four years and the airplanes at the end look real different. Okay, we have a phone call from Danny, a uh, question from Danny in Delaware. What's your question, Danny? What year did the Wright brothers um, build the airplanes? Forget. Danny, I can't hear you. Could you? Could you repeat that? What year did the Wright brothers build the, the first airplane? Okay, what, what year did the Wright brothers build their first airplane? Uh, their first gliders uh, were in 1900, 1901, 1902, and then uh, they worked up to the 1903 Wright Flyer, which they put the engine on. Okay, uh, now I think uh, Andrew has more for us to, to do over in the classroom, so uh, why don't we throw it back over to Andrew. Andrew, take it away. All righty. Now, you need to learn a little bit about how airplanes control themselves and the directions that they move, all right? So what I need everybody out there in America to do and everybody in here is to stand up and become an airplane, all right? We're going to do a little bit of airplane aerobics, all right? Airplane aerobics, very good. Okay, so everybody make sure you got plenty of room. Okay, very good. Okay, now the first movement you need to know is roll. So everybody, roll two, three, four, and pitch two, three, four, and yaw two, three, four, and pitch, pitch two, three, four, and roll two, three, four, exactly, okay? So now we know all the movements. 
Roll, pitch, and yaw. So here, quiz. All right, roll. Roll, very good. Pitch. Pitch. Very good. And yaw. Yaw. Very good. Yaw is my favorite. Yeah, yaw. All right. So now, now we need to sit down. Thank you. You did a great job. How did the Cadrone and early aircraft like it, even the Wright brothers, how did they control roll? Well, it's something called wing warping. So everybody pick up your wing warping boxes, please. And let me get my helpers here, my wing warping helpers. Let's go ahead and pick that end up there. Very good. Oops, we need to get that off of there. And go ahead and get where you need to be. And you need to grab this end. All right, very good. What this is, is an early example. This is a, a model of a strut and wire biplane. So we've got two wings biplane, and we've got our struts and our wires here, OK? And so what these guys are going to do for me is they're going to warp the wings to make the airplane roll this way. Can you do that? Ah, very good. So they warp the wings, they twist them, and this end goes up. And this end goes down. Oh, I'm sorry. That end goes down. Exactly. OK, now let's do the opposite. Let's roll this way. Ah, oh, that one up, that one down. Very good. And it rolls that way. Very nice. OK? So that's how the Cadrone and, just like the Wright brothers, they controlled roll. Very good. Excellent. Excellent job. Wing warping. Now, you guys with your boxes, try to do that. OK? Twist your boxes just like they did to get wing warping. All right? And roll to the right. And then roll to the left. Very good. All righty, we have a question from Daniel in Michigan. Go ahead, Daniel. Hi, I have a question. In the cockpit for the driver, is there a lot of room? Oh, that is a great question. And I think what we need to do is go back over to Ken at the Cadrone so you can see the cockpit and see how much room there really was in that cockpit. Go ahead, Ken. OK, uh, yeah, the, the pilot had quite a lot of room in there. Uh, he didn't have too many controls. In early World War I airplanes, there weren't that many controls. Uh, I think his, his problem was visibility, trying to see where he's going, because he's sitting behind the observer. He's sitting in between the two engines. He's got the massive struts and wires and the two wings over him. So visibility for landing, for instance, might be a little bit of a problem. OK. Uh, now we've got another call, uh, another question from Raquel from Michigan. What's your question, Raquel? How long did it take the Cadrone brothers to build the Cadrone? How long did it take the Cadrone builders to, uh, brothers to build the Cadrone? Well, they had a factory, and they were manufacturing these airplanes, so they had a whole bunch of people helping them. They were running the factory and designing airplanes. And uh, I'm really not sure how long it took, but back in World War I, the airplanes were fairly simple, so it probably wouldn't take that long to build it. Okay, back to Andrew. Andrew, uh, take it away. All right, step away. All righty. Now that we learned how the Cadrone and the Wright Flyer controlled roll with wing warping, we're going to talk about how modern airplanes, which we're full of here at the museum, how modern airplanes controlled roll and pitch and yaw. All right, so I'm going to have Kelsey help me out here. Kelsey, can you show everybody what the name, or tell everybody what the name is, and also how it would, con what direction it would control. So show me roll, please. The, yep. um, they're called, these are called uh, ailerons. Ailerons, very good. Ailerons. And um, they move up and down so the plane can turn and things. Okay. And, um, very good. Now, what about pitch? Pitch, the um, elevator. Elevators Go up and are down. used for okay. going. Up and down. Okay, much. good. Well, why don't you put the um, elevators up and let's throw it over here to Clay and see if it really does pitch it up. All right? Yep, look at that. The nose went straight up, just like that. Very good. So there's control surfaces all over these airplanes. And now we're going to move from the strut and wire, which was in mid around 1915, and now we're moving on to the late 1920s with the Winnie Mae. And we're going to look at a very more sleek looking airplane with Venetra. So we're clear for takeoff, Venetra. Hi, I'm Venetra Rangan, and I'm going to be telling you about the Winnie Mae. The Winnie Mae has a wingspan of 41 feet, a length of 28 feet, and a height of 9 feet. Now, let's take a closer look at the Winnie Mae.
Hi, we're back here at the Winnie Mae, but this time we have Bob <laughs> Vander Linden, a curator for the museum. Bob, will you tell me something about the plane? Thank you very much, Benitra, and welcome to the museum. One of my favorite places is here. <laughs> we're in, uh, underneath the wing of the Lockheed Vega, the Winnie Mae. This was an airplane flown by uh, Wiley Post, a very famous aviator of the 1930s. Uh, I flew it uh, on several very important flights. You can see listed back here, name of the aircraft. Four particular flights, one in 1930, a uh, cross-country flight, two around-the-world flights, and a high-altitude flight. Uh, this aircraft is a, known as Lockheed Vega. It was originally designed in 1927 uh, by Jack Northrop and was very popular with, uh, with record-setting uh, pilots. Right. Now, one interesting thing about this airplane is that it's made all out of wood. The whole airplane's out, made out of wood. It's called a monocoque fuselage. Mm -hmm. Monocoque means single shell, and it's very light and very strong. It also has a cantilevered wing, all made out of wood as well. Um, cantilevered means it has internal supports, not external right. supports. It has no wires, braces, that sort of thing on it. It has all the conventional services. We were just talking about, you know, pitch, yaw, and roll. Well, I just heard someone talk about the aileron. We had the aileron is right here, and it uh, flexes, and that helps, you know, control the rate of, ro uh, mm -hmm. of roll. Typical of all airplanes uh, from then even to this period. But this is a very special uh, Vega. Right. Uh, he modified it for, for his numerous flights. And, uh, well, in the, okay. Yeah, and uh, it would, he, he flew it, I said, around the world twice, and he used a, a, um, one of the first autopilots at that time. Do you have any questions? Yeah, actually, I do. Why did Wiley Post need to fly high altitude? Well, to fly high altitude, well, if you, the higher you fly, the faster you can go. Oh. Now, exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got lucky when he got on one of his high altitude flights. He accidentally discovered the jet stream. He's flying <laughs> uh -huh. merrily along at high altitude, thinking he's going to improve his airspeed. A, a nice deal. What he didn't know is he doubled it. On his flight in 1935, this last one here, an airplane which is supposed to cruise at about 170, 180 miles an hour cruised across the country at 340 miles an hour. Wow. And that's because he was up there above 30,000 feet in the jet stream. Mm -hmm. Now, you're going to fly that high, you have to have oxygen. Right. And that high, you have to have some way of, uh, of pressurization to protect you. Do you know how he did it? Um, I, uh, could the Winnie Mae actually have been pressurized as a whole plane? No, it couldn't. It couldn't because it's made out of wood and there was just too many seams and cracks in right. it uh, for, for air to leak out of. Okay. So uh, Y.E. Post used a pressure suit, right? He, he used a pressure suit, exactly. The world's first pressure suit. Yeah. We have a question from Jenny from Virginia. What type of airplane did Amelia Earhart fly, and did they ever find the wreckage? Um, actually, Amelia Earhart uh, flew an airplane very similar to this. We have it downtown. Mm -hmm. It's another Lockheed Vega. It's a very, it's a bright red Lockheed Vega. She flew that airplane to become the first woman to fly nonstop solo across the Atlantic in 1932. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not the airplane, obviously, she disappeared in. That was a, a, um, a Lockheed Electra. Uh, she disappeared in, in 1937, and uh, no one ever found her. Uh, Paul from Michigan, you have a question? Um, what, in, what inspired the Wright brothers, Wright brothers to make a plane? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. What inspired the Wright brothers to make a plane? Oh, well, there are many uh, stories about what inspired the Wright brothers to make the first airplane, but uh, as children, they became fascinated by birds and by uh, little helicopter toys that their father gave them. And uh, both brothers were very smart and very creative and energetic. And from that point, that point onwards, they just started researching flight at a time when other people were looking at it but didn't understand it. They were the first really to truly understand uh, the problems of flight. They uh, solved the problems and built the world's first successful airplane in 1903. Okay, okay, and that's it. Uh, we'll go to Blake. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Venetra. Uh, there's a lot of good information on this show so far, but like, but now it's time for some activities. Let's do some stuff, and maybe at home or in the classroom, you got some marshmallows. And Andrew, those are some good calisthenics I saw you doing before. It's like I know how you keep your girlish figure now. But get out your marshmallows and also your syringes, and we're going to use those. Andrew and Margie are going to use those in the show. So take it away, Andrew and Margie. All right, thanks, Blake, and yes, I'm glad you recognized. I have been working hard. Um, we have Margie here to help us with the pressure activities, but before we do that, we've got an email question that Christine would like to answer. Go ahead, Christine. 
And we have a question from Joel Kellogg, wondering where the name uh, Winnie Mae comes from. The plane, uh, the Winnie Mae, was actually owned by an oil magnate called F.C. Hall. And his daughter was Winnie Mae, so he named the plane after his daughter. Okay, Joel? Very good. Great question. All right, Margie, you're on. Okay, great. Now, we heard a little bit about Wiley Post, and he was flying really high where there's less air pressure. Down here on the Earth, we have air pressure. All the air is pushing down to us. And here at sea level, we have quite a bit of air pressure. If you pressure. look at a um, one inch square on your arm, there's about 14.8 pounds, about 15 pounds of pressure on that small space. It's about like two gallons of water pressing down on you, air pressure. Okay, now when you fly higher, you lose air pressure. The higher you go, the less pressure you have. So everybody should have a syringe like this, and I'm gonna ask you to pull the bottom out of that for me. Yep. Pop it right out, then take your little marshmallow, pop it right in, and do not cover the hole. Put your marshmallow in there and don't squish your marshmallow. Push it in, you got that? Thank you, it should look just like that. Everybody got that? That's now, the end with your what's thumb. your name? Jonas. Jonas. Jonas is going to hold the plunger for us, and Molly. Molly's going to put her finger over the top there. Go ahead, Jonas, pull it back. And what happens to that marshmallow when we reduce the pressure? It gets bigger. Yeah. That's right. Can you imagine that being your head? <laughs> okay, we're going to try that. You can let go of the pressure there, and you can put that down. We're going to try it on a little bit larger scale here in our bell jar. We've got a vacuum pump on that. Right. And why don't we go ahead and reduce the pressure on that and let's see what happens. Oh Up my it goes. Goodness. It's getting larger and larger and larger because normally we have pressure inside acting against the pressure outside. Otherwise, we'd squish. So we've got the pressure there. And could you hold that for me? Now we're going to go ahead and put the pressure back in and see what happens. And it goes back down in size. Shrinks back down. All righty. Now it comes time for okay. the gross part. Jonas, what does that look like? Uh, blood. Yeah, but oh. it's not really blood. It's not really blood. We just use a little red water. Right. But it's to represent blood. So this is representing the blood inside your body. All right, so if you take pressure too quickly off your body, the blood in your body is going to do something, and we're going to see what it is. And I want you guys to tell us what you think that is. Go ahead, Jonas. Turn it on. Okay, now everybody watch carefully. We're reducing the pressure in here. So we're flying watch higher watch and higher blood. and higher in altitude. The higher you go, the less pressure you have. That's because all the air is piled on top of each other. Kind of like if you piled on top of each other and squished each other down. The blood is starting to boil. Yeah. It's starting to boil. So that would happen inside your veins. That would hurt. Now, for one last one. This is Who's kind of brave? our favorite. Are you brave? Boiling water. Stick your hand in there. Um, it's normal. It's not hot. It's not It's not hot, is it? Because when we reduce the pressure, we can go ahead and boil things at room temperature because the air normally pushes down on water and keeps the gas in it. All right. Well, we've taken that pressure off, so the gas is yeah. inside the water and that's exactly, can bubble out. And that's exactly why you need a pressure suit. And so Blake is going to show us what Wiley Post did to keep his body from doing that. Let's go ahead and look at that. All right, hey, thanks, Andrew. All right, oh, my poor little Wiley Post. Oh, poor little, mm. let's put you in the bell jar. All right, because uh, all that stuff that Andrew and Margie were saying before about pressure and like what happens to people as you go higher and higher in altitude is totally true. It's not really applicable to all of the things that we're talking about today because most of all, like our aircraft are pressurized and Wiley Post designed a pressurized suit to keep himself more comfortable but if say oh he lost his head oh 
But to say you were going into space, this is one of the reasons that you would need a spacesuit. And Wiley Post's original pressure suit was the ancestor of modern pressurization, including airplanes and also spacesuits. So let's shrink him back down because he's, I think he's had quite, quite enough. And take a question. Oh, that's so depressing. Andrew from Michigan, help us out. Give us a good question so we can take our ball. <laughs> help, help us. Andrew, what's your question? Okay. If the pilot got killed, would, the, would there be a jo joystick for the observer to control the plane? If the pilot were what, would there be a joystick? If the pilot got killed. If the pilot got killed, would there be a joystick to control the plane? I think what you might be asking about is something called autopilot. And autopilot is something we'll be talking about a little bit later on in the show. Right. Do we have another question? Oh, yeah, we do, from Katie in Missouri. Hey, Katie, what's your question? Um, how big is the biggest plane ever made? How big is the biggest plane ever made? Ooh, because there have been some pretty big ones. I wonder if Bob Vanderlinden can answer that for us. Hey, Bob, do you have an answer? The biggest plane ever made. Biggest plane ever made. Uh, for right now, the biggest plane ever made is a uh, airplane built in the former Soviet Union, the AN-225. It is a huge six engine uh, transport. Looks a lot like the uh, C5A, only it's a lot bigger. It weighs over 1.2 million pounds. In the next, by 19, about 2006, uh, Airbus of Europe is going to produce the world's largest transport uh, airliner, and that will seat about, seat about 555 people, and that will have, that will weigh almost a million pounds as well, but that's not in service yet. So we got a phone call from Michigan. Michigan, what's your question? Mona. How old were the Wright brothers when they built their plane? How old were the Wright brothers when they built their plane? Well, they were relatively young, but I, I, I don't really know. Maybe Bob Vanderlinden knows. Bob, do you know much about the Wright brothers? Because you seem to be taking a lot of Wright brothers' questions today. Well, that's reasonable. Uh, Wright brothers are very important. I don't know their specific ages, but they were in their, in their early to mid-19, excuse me, early to mid-40s. So uh, they're young as far as I'm concerned, but probably not as far as you're concerned. All right, thanks. Those are some good questions. We'll be taking questions later on in the show, too. But now let's talk to Vivian. And Vivian can tell us about our third plane in the show, the Stratoliner, which I've been standing in front of the whole time. Vivian, what can you tell us about it? Hi, my name is Vivian Lau, and I'm here to talk about the Stratoliner or the Boeing 307. It has a wingspan of 170 feet and has a length of 74 feet. And also the height of 20 feet, which is about four of me stacked on top of each other. Now on to the Boeing. Hey, I'm back here at the Starliner with Bob van der Linden. Now, I know this plane was pressurized. Now, mm -hmm. well, how is that important in aviation? Well, uh, thank you, Vivian. Uh, well, it's very important because of, uh, the pressuri pressurization allows the airplane to fly much higher uh, and so it can fly faster, uh, so cut down you know, the speed across the country, uh, you get a destination quicker, but it's much more comfortable because when you're flying at above 20,000 feet, which this airplane could do, and of course, a modern airliner now flies above 35,000 feet, uh, it's much smoother uh, because most of the weather is below that, and so you can, you know, it's much more comfortable. And being a pressurized airplane at the high altitude, you can walk around the airplane in shirt sleeve comfort because it feels like you're only at 8,000 feet when in fact you're much higher. Okay, so what was it like before it was pressurized then? Well, before airplanes were pressurized, and we have several airplanes here that were like that, it was rather uncomfortable because you were flying no more than about 8,000 feet. 
um, usually even less than that. And of course, you're flying through weather, through storms. You're being bounced all over the place, which on a clear day is not a problem, but on a, on a, on a rainy day with clouds and turbulence could be very upsetting in more ways than one. There, uh, air sickness was a big problem in the 1930s on unpressurized airplanes. Okay. Is there any more, uh, anything else you could tell us about the Stratoliner? Well, I mean, the, it's a beautiful airplane, as you can see. It's polished to a beautiful finish. Uh, the Boeing company restored it for us just a couple years ago. And uh, if you notice, you know, this big, wide fuselage on it. It's basically what they did was they took a B-17 bomber and put a specially designed round fuselage on it that's pressurized. And to make sure it was pressurized safely, they uh, put these row after upon row after upon row of rivets. You can see all these rivets here. They weren't sure how strong it needed to be. They, had, they ran their numbers and their calculations, but they weren't taking any chances. So this thing is built like a flying tank. Cool. Now I have some questions. How many strata lines were made? Well, only about 10. Uh, the first one crashed, and the other nine uh, were entered service. Actually, only eight entered service. The ninth one went to Howard Hughes. He used it as a private airplane. And um, where? Uh, we have a, a phone call from, from Syria. What's your question? Um, what was the latest plane made and how is it different from, uh, how is it different from the first plane made? How does the latest plane differ from the first plane made? Yeah. Well, more than anything else, the first plane being the Wright Flyer is, is a biplane. Uh, so it has two wings on it, uh, very rudimentary controls, two propellers. Uh, the newest planes, uh, be they military aircraft or commercial aircraft, are much, much larger. They almost all only have a single wing without the wires and the struts. And of course, instead of carrying just one person, they can carry hundreds of people. Uh, I have a call from Megan from Michigan. Your when question, Megan? Was, I'm sorry. When was the first, the first successful plane ride from I, I, the Wright what, Brothers. What was the question again? Oh, the very what? first, oh, where was the first successful plane ride of the Wright Brothers? That was at uh, Kill Devil's Hills in North Carolina, in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, on the Outer Banks. Savannah from Michigan, you have a question? Savannah, I understand you have a question? Lavelle from Pennsylvania, you have a question? Ever meet. Hey Lavelle, how are you? Yes, fine, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. What's your question? How big was the smallest plane ever made? How big was the smallest plane ever made? Uh, that is a rather uh, tough question. Uh, we have some very large airplanes here and some very small airplanes here. We've got a couple behind me, like a BD-5, tiny little single-seat airplane that's about the size of a, of a small car. Um, and then, you know, you get 747s, a new A380, and that AN-225, as I mentioned. Huge airplanes. You've got airplanes that go from a couple hundred pounds to a million pounds. All right, with, with that, uh, we'll take it to Andrew. Thank you. All righty, we're back here in the classroom, and they're going to show you the inside of that beautiful Stratoliner. But before they do, we're going to talk about some beautiful interiors that are lined up here with some of our students. However, I've just got word that we've got an email question that just came in, and so we're going to cut to Christine for that email question. Christine, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Actually, it's from one of our uh, classroom members uh, here in Northern Virginia. Oh, excellent. Uh, so it's from Danny. If you will give us your question. Um, I'm Danny from Fairfax County, and what is the primary purpose of the Stratoliner? Uh, the very early planes, the Strut and Wire, Question. really had a military uh, uh, introduction, and when you go to these mature propeller air airplanes, a lot of them yeah. are commercial. And the one that we have, the shiny Stratoliner, uh, was commercial transport, taking about 33 passengers, as, as we heard, I also heard to go to the Caribbean in the uh, 1940s, it cost $12,000 in today's term for a round trip. Wow. Thank you, Andrew. How much to go to the Caribbean? $12,000 $12, in today's $12,000. Wow. My goodness. 
Alrighty, so let's take a look at some of these interior designs. I have with us two aerospace experts that have made a beautiful pink plane, and I just love it, girls. Now, please tell me, um, tell me your name, and also tell me a little bit about your robot mullet pilot there. Well, my name is Aaron Phillips, and our robot, he has a mullet, and it's a pink mullet, and he's a robot. Yeah, it's a hot pink mullet, and he controls the plane. Unlike just having a regular passenger, just like a regular pilot, he controls the plane for everybody. All right. And what's up with this beauty salon there, Brittany? Well, it's, you have a special, on Mondays you get a free mullet and every day you can get a free hair dye for hot pink only. Oh, great. And it specializes in mullets and pink hair dyeing. Excellent, beautiful. All right, now before we go, I'm sorry ladies, I'm gonna have to go to my favorite, all right? Sorry. I wanna go to this guy here. He has converted a B-29 interior into an RV in the sky for home, for home use. And this thing has got like four projection screens. What do you think in there? Um, a lot of luxury. A lot of luxury, yeah. Comfort and yeah. Lazy Boys. Oh, Lazy Boys, that's Vince. nice. Very yeah. nice. So you're all about comfort then? Yeah. I think it's all about comfort here. Beautiful. All right, well, so it's now time to take a look at that beautiful Stratoliner interior with Blake. Take it over, Blake. Thanks, Andrew. I'm back here with Bob Vanderlin, and we're still looking at the Stratoliner. And Bob, this looks like I was looking at this before. This is a big, fat airplane. It looks oh, like yeah. a blimp. With well, wings on it. Yeah, about like that. It, it's big and wide, like a big sausage. Uh, it needed to be wide uh, for the pressurization, big round uh, you know, structure for it. But that, that big structure allowed for a lot of room on the inside. A lot of room on the inside. What was it like inside this airplane? Um, it's like a floating, flying living room. The, the interior on that is just it's beautiful. Yeah, like I'm looking at these pictures, and, like, and it, looks like, it looks like a train in there. Just about, but a really nice train, a Pullman car. It's yeah. the, the finest way you could travel with big, comfortable uh, seats that could fold down into beds, uh, special berths, uh, excellent service, a lot of room to stand up and walk around. It was a very, very nice way to travel. That's amazing. And how many people could fit in this airplane? 33. 30, it carried 33 people. Only 33 people only, in this whole airplane. Exactly. And rarely did it fly with that many because they usually didn't have that many passengers. Yeah. But, uh, that, you know, if you go inside and take a look at the interior of it, it is it's spectacular. It's a very nice way to fly. Yeah, I can imagine. All right, we're going to take some questions now. We got a question from Nicole. Nicole, what's your question? Um, I wanted to know how long were the wings on the Condren? How long were the wings on the what? The, the Condren? The Condren? Yes. I know it's a little hard. I can't even say it because it's French and I don't speak French. But how, Condren. Uh, Condren. Uh -huh. How long were those wings? I have no idea. You have no idea? No idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, it's like... Uh, I, Ken would know that. Ken it, would know? It, yeah. Yeah. Is Ken available? It's probably yeah. about 50 or 60 feet. But, Ken, um, yeah, but Ken, how long were those wings? Okay. Um, I have to say, I don't know the exact length of the uh, wingspan on the Caudron, but uh, 50, 60 feet sounds like a pretty good guess. Kirk, Kirk? Um, All right, so. How, big, how many planes did the Wright brothers make? Oh, Kirk, that's a good question. How many planes did the Wright brothers make? Because they made a bunch before. You know, it's not like they just built one airplane and then flew it and it all magically worked. It was like they did a lot of testing before that. Do you know how many airplanes they I made? I don't know precisely how they, many. It's like they, they, they did, made a lot. They made a lot. They, they made, they were the first. Of course, they invented the airplane and they were also uh, invented the aircraft factory and they were producing aircraft until uh, about 1916. Yeah, they did a lot. They built a lot of test aircrafts, and it depends on what you mean by airplane, because they built a lot of test gliders, and before they even got to the powered airplanes too. So we have another question from from Danielle in Indiana. Danielle, what's your question for us? How high can the B-29 fly? How high can the B-29 fly? Oh, the B-29. We haven't even gotten to the B-29 yet but you today, will. but we will. The answer like, is about 30,000 feet. About 30,000 yeah. <laughs> feet. So that's really about, I want to say, like a little less than six miles, about six miles up. So that's a good height for an airplane. Yeah. All right. So, and we're going to go to Christine right now because Christine's talking to somebody who has a question about the Stratoliner. Christine, help us out. 
We have a, a question from fourth graders, Coelho and Murray. They want to know why the propellers on the Stratoline are on the wing and not on the nose. If we go back to the biplane, to the uh, quadrant, the first plane that we saw, that was just 80 horsepower, uh, about a third or a quarter of a car. We go to the Stratoliner with its four propellers, you've got 900 horsepower, you would need one enormous, enormous propeller. You probably would need very tall landing gear. So we need more than one propeller and they stretch them along the wings and so they have to be fixed very, very firmly. So that's why they're on the wings. You need more propellers than you can actually put on the nose because you're getting very powerful uh, air, uh, airplanes now. And thank you, Coelho and Murray. Thanks a lot, Christine. We have another question from Savannah. Savannah, what's your question? Um, although neither are very practical, is Cauldron G4 or the Winnie Mae more practical today? Ooh, which is more practical today, the Caudron or the Winnie Mae? I would have to say the Winnie Mae because it flew very well. The Caudron was a very rudimentary design. The wing warping was very rudimentary, very simple, uh, not very, the airplane itself wasn't that strong. The, air, the engines were very unreliable. Yeah. The Winnie Mae has, is, is a well-designed airplane, a good, strong airplane with a big, reliable engine on it. So I would say the Winnie Mae. Yeah, because the Winnie Mae looks more modern. It does, yeah. and it is very modern in every yeah. way, shape, and form. E yeah, even for even for, even the, for today, for a, a wooden airplane too. Well, there's nothing wrong with wood. It's an excellent material to build aircraft out of. All right, thanks a lot, Bob. Glad to. All right, we've, I think we're done talking about the Stratoliner for now. But now let's go to Dylan, and Dylan can tell us a little bit about the B-29, which is our next airplane in our series today. Dylan, take it away. Hi, I'm Dylan Howard, and my plane's the B-29. The Super Fortress has a wingspan of 141 feet, a length of 99 feet, and a height of 30 feet. Now let's take a look at the B-29. Uh, we're back here at the B-29, and I'm here with Ken, who was at the Cadron earlier. And Ken, why don't you tell us something about the B-29? Okay. Well, I noticed in your introduction you mentioned the name that Boeing gave to the airplane. Could you uh, repeat that again? Yeah, Boeing gave the name Super Fortress to the B-29. That's right. And uh, the reason they called it that, they were building a bomber called the B-17 Flying Fortress. And the B-29 was about a third again as big as the Flying Fortress and twice as heavy. And so it really was a super fortress. And it was also a very uh, advanced airplane for the day. In fact, most sophisticated piston engine bomber of World War II. And we've been talking about pressurization and the Stratoliner. And uh, Boeing, of course, built the Stratoliner and pressurized it. And they use pressurization in this airplane, too. Yeah. Um, but only in certain parts. Like the forward crew compartment was pressurized. The aft crew compartment behind the wing was pressurized. And the tail gun position was pressurized. Now, why do you think they didn't pressurize the whole fuselage? Because like in the bomb bay, once they dropped the bomb, it would just open up and there would be no use because all the air would be sucked out. That's right. If you open the bomb bay doors, first of all, they don't seal tight and they'd leak. But when you open the doors, you, all the pressure would go out. And that'd be, that's kind of violent. You don't want to do that. Uh, it also had other sophisticated uh, things. Uh, now, this airplane doesn't have defensive gun turrets except for the tail guns. But the regular B-29s would have a turret right there another one up on top just above it, and two more just like it toward the rear of the airplane, plus the tail guns. Now the difference in these turrets, as opposed to uh, the turrets on the earlier bombers, the gunners weren't in the turrets. They were in sighting positions on the sides of the airplane, and uh, since the turrets were remotely controlled, 
one gunner could actually fire two or maybe even three turrets if he had the best shot in the airplane coming in. So uh, that was pretty advanced too. And they had some advanced avionics on it. For instance, you see a kind of a gray thing hanging down here from the back? Yeah. What do you think that might be? Uh, it's the radar that they use to drop the bomb when there's clouds and you can't see. Right, the uh, uh, forward, uh, the bombardier sits up in the nose and he ordinarily uses a bomb sight that's a periscope or a telescope, really. But if there's clouds and you can't see the target, then the radar operator uh, would use the radar that's under that ray dome and uh, he could help guide the bombardier to the target. Uh, do you, I understand you might have a couple of questions yeah. for me. Uh, what's the difference between dropping or the altitude difference between dropping a regular bomb compared to dropping the atomic bomb. Okay, the difference between regular bombs and atomic bombs. Well, actually, uh, they did. They used several altitudes because over Japan was, was where this airplane was used. And when they first tried to use it over to Japan, they were trying to do high altitude precision bombing from about 30,000 feet. But they had a lot of trouble. The winds were bad and all that. So uh, they switched over to night bombing where they came down really low to like no more than 12,000 feet and they dropped fire bombs and burned the cities. But now when they went to the atomic bomb, they had to go back up high again to make sure that they didn't get caught in the blast. And that, the atomic bomb was dropped from 30,800 feet and uh, that gave them time to get, up, get away. Um, you have another one? Uh, yeah, when you drop the bomb at night, or What's the difference between a night mission and a day mission? A night mission and a day mission, uh, well, of course, you're going in at night when it's dark, but the reason they went, one reason they went to night missions is that the Japanese didn't have a good night fighter force. And also, it's harder for the gunners to see you from when they're shooting from the ground. And uh, also, since they didn't have a good night fighter force, at night, they could take those gun turrets out and uh, lose about 7,000 pounds of weight which they could use for uh, more bombs or more gas. Is that Tim from Wisconsin? I uh, think we have on the line. What's your question, Tim? You there, Tim? Oh, what? What plane went the highest? What plane went the highest? Yeah. Okay. Uh, there was a rocket-propelled airplane called the X-15. And that one got up to 354,200 feet. And uh, that's about the highest, unless you count the space shuttle. When the space shuttle re-entered and started acting as an airplane like a glider, it was a lot higher. OK, Brandon from Illinois, what's your question? Yeah, how is a turbine engine able to fly through rain? How is a turbine engine able to fly through rain? Well, uh, it, it works pretty well unless you get a really drenching downpour, and then some, some early turbine engines would be uh, a little uh, unhappy with that. But you know, Bob Vanderlinden might know more about that than I do. Uh, okay, Bob, do you, uh, can you answer uh, why, how turbine engines uh, uh, can fly in rain? It really, is not a pro it really isn't a problem flying in rain. It, it, you may think that there's so much water there would basically put the flame out. It won't. There's uh, plenty of air in, in a rainstorm. As, as Ken said, unless it's an absolute drenching downpour, it really isn't a problem. Same reason you can drive a car in the rain. It's not a problem. We have another question uh, from Sean from Illinois. Sean, what's your question? Yeah, um, my question is, what is the cheapest plane that they ever built? The cheapest plane they ever built? Probably a hang glider. <laughs> uh, because that's, uh, that's really simple. You have no engine. Uh, but, uh, hmm, you know, I really don't know the cheapest ever. <laughs> um, OK, Christine, over in the classroom, do you have any questions? Welcome back to the classroom. We have uh, a question here, if you'll take it away. Hi, I'm Casey from the Potomac School, and my question is, why did the pilots want to fly at such a high altitude in the B-29? Well, you heard in the Stratoliner that it was really comfortable at high altitude, no turbulence. Uh, but of course, the uh, B-29 had some other roles as well. Uh, if you're uh, doing uh, a bombing mission, you want to be as high as you can possibly go. So uh, the B-29, uh, went way above the uh, uh, the Stratoliner at 20,000 feet. 
And we have a second classroom question. Um, my name is Sky Young, and I'm from Harper Park Middle School. And my question is, how many crew can the B-29 hold? OK, a great question. I know that there uh, is a pilot and that a regular B-29 has five gun turrets, but I really don't know how many. So I'm going to send this over to uh, Ken to really give us the complete answer. Ken, can you help me out on that one? I sure can. The uh, regular crew of the B-29 was 10. And that included the pilot, co-pilot, navigator, bombardier, flight engineer, radio operator, the turret gunners. It took a lot of people to uh, keep a big, sophisticated airplane like this running and working properly. And, uh, you know, the earlier question about how high they flew, they flew that high to get above the anti-aircraft anti fire and to uh, make it harder for the enemy fighters to uh, maneuver when they were attacking. Ken, I have another question for you. Okay. Why are the wingspans so massive? Okay, it, it does have a massive wingspan. And that's a sp uh, one of the advanced features of the airplane. The, air the wing is called a high aspect ratio wing. That is, it's long and thin. And that's a really good wing for high altitude and high speed. And that's great while you're on the mission and you're cruising along there. But it wouldn't be so good for landing because you don't want to land at high speed, usually. Uh, so the Boeing did, company did a very uh, smart thing. They put big flaps back here on the airplane. And those flaps not only moved back at first, and that gave it more wing area, and then they moved down so that the wing had more curvature, and a, a wing that's curved more provides more lift. And Boeing still does that today on their airliners. That if you watch in there, on an airliner, the air flaps come down and then go like that, and that helps it to fly a lot more slower. Okay, uh, we're going to uh, Aaron at the Dash 80, and the Dash 80. Okay, over to you, Aaron. Hi, my name is Aaron Phillips, and my plane is the Boeing 367-80, otherwise known as the Dash 80. A few stats I have on the Dash 80 are the wingspan is 130 feet, the length is 128 feet, and the height is 38 feet. Now let's look at the Dash 80. Here we are back of the Dash 80, but this time I'm joined by Bob Vanderlinden, an expert on the Dash 80, and he's going to give us a couple more facts. Thank you, Aaron, and welcome again to the museum. We're here standing in front of the Boeing 367-80, which is America's first passenger airliner. It's the prototype for it, which became the 707 back in 1954 is when it first flew. It's a conventional jet airliner, as you might think of it today. It's similar to the Stratoliner. It has a nice pressurized fuselage but it has two important features that make it very, very different and made it very, very successful. The most important thing, obviously, is the jet engine. As you see here, this is a massive engine. It doesn't have a propeller because it doesn't need one. A jet engine basically is one big compressor. It spins and spins and spins, compresses the air, fuels injected into it, ignited, and when it expands, it produces a great deal of thrust and just keeps spinning the engine. Because of that, you get a lot of power and a and believe it or not, a very reliable engine because yeah. all a jet does is spin. You know, the engine in your car, it's, the pistons are going like crazy and the parts are flying <laughs> everywhere. In this engine, they just spin and spin and spin. Also, it burns kerosene, which is a lot cheaper than, than gasoline, uh, which is very good, helps keep the cost down. And of course, with the extra power, you can go a lot faster. But what really helped this airplane go a lot faster is this wing. You can see this wing up here? Yeah. It's called a swept wing. It's swept about 35 degrees. Now, most wings are straight like this, 
this airplane, actually the wings were swept 35 degrees backwards, which meant it greatly reduced the drag so the airplane could go faster without, with less interference from the air. So between the swept wing and the power from the jet engines, and it had four engines, we we're only looking at one, but it had four engines, this airplane could fly, could cruise very comfortably at over 500 miles an hour. So you have any questions? Actually, I do. My first question is, is the 707 really the most flown plane like it's said to be? Well, they've built over 800 of them and about a, over a thousand in terms of the, including the military, the, the tanker version of it. Uh, there are other airplanes that they built more of. The 737, we built almost 5,000 of those. Wow. But having said that, the fuselage on the 707 is the same fuselage that's on the 727, 737, 757. So it's a very, very successful design. You have another question? Yep. I how, thought so. How large is the vertical stabilizer on the Dash 80? You know, I haven't measured it, to be honest with you. It's about, I think, about, about 35, 40 feet. The nice thing about it is it bends down. That's how we got it in the building. Because we were okay. worried to take it through the, through the hangar door there. It might <laughs> not fit. Well, it just yeah, folds big. right on over. <laughs> well, every airline you've ever been on traces its history back to this airplane. So with that, let's go back to Andrew. All righty, we're back here in the classroom, and I want to talk to you guys about how Boeing introduced this plane to the world. It was in 1955. This huge jet comes flying over this crowd at a boat show, boat race, and the pilot decided to do a barrel roll. It took this thing and did two rolls over the crowd. The crowd was amazed. The owner of Boeing, they say, almost had a heart attack, but that's just rumor. Can you imagine something this large acting like a fighter jet? This thing is huge. Must have been one heck of a pilot. His name was Tex Johnston. He stuck his life and the company on the line, but supposedly sold a lot of airplanes, showing how maneuverable this thing is. Pretty impressive. Now, we've talked a lot about planes getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, let's talk about planes getting faster. This guy's getting really, really fast, but the SR-71 is the fastest we've got in this museum. So let's kick it on over to the SR-71. Hi, I'm Brittany, and this is the SR-71 Blackbird. The wingspan of the Blackbird is 56 feet. The length of the Blackbird is 107 feet. The height is 19 feet and the speed is Mach 3.3. And now for a closer look at the Blackbird. Blackbird joined by Ken Roberts. Hi Brittany. Uh, you know this this is another reconnaissance airplane but this one looks like it's a little faster than the Cardone, don't you think? Yeah. Do you know how what the top speed of this airplane was? Isn't it about Mach 3? Mach 3. Three times the speed of sound. That's faster than a rifle bullet if you can imagine that. It's so fast that this airplane flew from Washington uh, from Los Angeles, California to Washington DC in one hour four minutes and 20 seconds and it flies very high up to 80,000 feet and it depends on high altitude and high speed to uh, stay safe. Now um, <clears throat> the, uh, the skin is black and it's titanium, made out of titanium which is a metal that re uh, rejects heat and because if it was uh, aluminum it would, it would melt. And uh, I understand we also have another expert joining us, Scott Willie, who uh, is a fellow docent of mine and he's also the guy who helped move the airplane over here and he washed it several times. So, uh, Scott? Hello, Ken. Hello, Scott. Uh, do you have anything you'd like to particularly uh, tell us about the SR-71? I know it's your favorite airplane. 
Well, it's one of my favorites, and I think uh, it's one of the ones the public really enjoys seeing because of the very odd shape and the uh, very, very unique propulsion system. One thing that the uh, young boys and girls ought to understand is it has an engine that is considerably different than anything that has ever flown on an airplane before or since, and that's what allows the airplane, along with its very unique shape, to fly as high and fast as it does. Scott, I think uh, Brittany might have a question for you. Yes. Um, how do the pilots get into the cockpit? If, uh, if you and Ken can point up to the two cockpits for the pilot and the reconnaissance systems operator, you'll see that there is a, a canopy around the window area, and those are hinged in the back. So when the airplane is sitting on the ground, the two canopies uh, uh, lift backwards from the, uh, uh, from the hinges there, so they're pointed uh, uh, up into the sky, and the pilots have a special ladder that they climb up in their flight suits carrying their air conditioners because they get very hot inside and have to climb in underneath that canopy. They're strapped in, and then the two canopies uh, lower and seal as you see them now. Okay, Scott, I think we've got another question from Brittany yeah. here. Yes. How do they refuel the SR-71, and where is the refueling receptacle? Just behind that second canopy where the small window is, there's a hole on top of the airplane that has a door covering it normally, and the airplane would fly just underneath a refueling airplane that has a pipe at the back of it. And a refueling operator, you can think of him as a gas station attendant, slips that pipe into the hole in the top okay, of the Scott, airplane. Okay, Scott, thank you very much. Uh, yep. We're, we're uh, going to go over, back over to Andrew now, and uh, he's got something to show us. Great. Andrew, take it away. All right. Now, these planes are moving so fast, we need to talk about the speed of sound. The speed of sound is about 760 miles per hour, all right? So what we're going to do is we're going to pretend Vivian here can move at the speed or faster than the speed of sound. And these slinkies represent the sound that's coming out of her in all directions. And notice how the wavelengths here are the same distance apart on this side as they are on this side, OK? Now, no movement, OK? Now, She's going to start moving at the speed of sound. Go, Vivian. Stop. All right. Now, look over here. Look how tight those wavelengths are. Compared to over here, look how far apart they are now. She is going faster than the speed of sound. So she's getting further away from her sound over here, but she's getting closer to her sound over here. All right? Now, go all the way until there's no more room. Boom. All right. What do you think is going to happen when she gets to that point and goes faster? She's going to um, go faster than the speed of sound and create a sonic boom. Okay, right. She's going to make this huge boom, right? Now, has anybody here ever heard of a boom or heard a sonic boom before? Yeah? All right. Well, you're going to hear one now, okay? So, why don't you guys watch out? I don't want to whip anybody. So, move on up. Drop the slinkies. Take the slinky over here. All right, I need her to help me out here. I'm going to do one, and then we're going to let, let Vivian give it a try. Step on back. Okay, so the end of this whip is going to go faster than the speed of sound. You ready? Wow, look at that. Whoop, messed up. Whoop, messed up. All right, we had a good sonic boom on that first one, all right? So let's have Vivian give it a try. Come on. All right, she's giving it a good try. All right, so now we're going to move on to from a military airplane that was able to go faster than the speed of sound to the Concorde which was a commercial jet airliner that could travel from one side of the Atlantic to the other in such a small amount of time, you would actually get there before you left. So let's run on over and check out the Concorde. Hi, my name is Kelsey Carr, and my plane is the Concorde. The wingspan of the Concorde is 84 feet, and the length is 202 feet. The height of the Concorde is 37 feet. Now, let's take a look at the Concorde.
Hi, um, we're back at the Concord, and now I'm with Bob Vanderhill. Can you tell anything um, about it for well, me? Thank you very much. We're back here at the Concord. This is the world's first really successful supersonic transport. It's the fastest airliner ever to fly. It started service in about 1976, and it flew until last year, 2003. Uh, it could fly at about 1,320 miles an hour, which is awfully fast. If you could get across the Atlantic in only four hours, it takes about eight hours normally, four hours in this thing. What made it successful was this wing, which is a very advanced, very sleek delta wing, a very narrow wingspan, but big wing area on it. A lot of lift, great maneuverability at low speed and high speed. The problem with that is, for an airplane like that to fly like that, that wing makes the airplane's nose very high on takeoff and landing. So to solve that problem, they have a very tall landing gear, you can see right there, and up above us, you can see the little hinge line right there, the entire nose would just pivot down, particularly on landing to allow the pilots to be able to see down onto the ground for the land, for the, for their, for their landing. You know? Would it be harder for the Concorde to land because it's flying supersonic? And it's uh, so big? Actually, no, because by the time uh, you're slowed down for landing, you're doing about 200, 250 miles an hour. It's subsonic at that time. I understand we have a question from Michelle in Virginia. What's your question, Michelle? Um, what is the fastest plane and how fast can it go? What's the fastest plane and how fast can it go? Well, it depends on your definition of an airplane. The Concorde is the fastest airliner. It went Mach, uh, Mach 2, which is twice the speed of sound. The fastest air-breathing aircraft ever to fly is the SR-71, which you just saw. And the fastest aircraft of all time is the rocket-powered North American X-15, which we have one uh, downtown at the museum. Uh, Derek from Indiana, I understand you have a question. Derek, how are you? Pretty good, how are you? Fine, thanks. What's your question? Yeah, my question is, um, how often does a tire need to be replaced on a commercial jetliner such as a Boeing 747 well, uh, for landing. How, how often does a, the tire need to be replaced? That's a good question. I don't know the exact answer, but that depends on the wear. They're very strong tires and they're designed to take a ter you know, terrific impact. Obviously, you don't use them that much because it's flying, but when, when, you, when you land, the, airplane, the, the, the tire hit, hit the, um, the concrete very hard. The most landing speeds are over 160 miles an hour, so it's very, very hard on it. And they're very, they're very high pressure, so they're very strong. Uh, Craig from Michigan, we have a question. What's your question, Craig? Um, how fast is the fastest airplane? Uh, as I mentioned before, the very fastest airplane ever is the North American X-15. And that was Mach 6.7, which is 4,500 miles an hour. Jennifer from Michigan, what's your question? How many people does the Winnie May seat? How many people does the Winnie May seat? Uh, the Winnie Mae itself only sat one person, that was the pilot. However, that, that type of aircraft, the Lockheed Vega, could hold about five or six people. Austin, uh, from Michigan, you have a question? Um, how, how come the airplanes can't go in space? How, why can't airplanes go in space? Well, the problem, most airplanes, with the exception of the uh, X-15, which, by the way, could go in space, uh, have air-breathing engines either a piston engine like you have in your car or a jet engine. They all require air to help the, the fuel combust. Once you get up in space, there's no air, therefore the engines won't work. Okay, with that, uh, let's go to Blake. Thanks, Bob. Those are some good questions, especially that last one, too, about why, why can't you fly airplanes in space? And Bob's answer was absolutely right. You need air for the engines to burn if they're not rocket engines. But you also, airplanes also just need air because air is what lifts up the airplanes. If you go into space, then you don't really need to worry about the shape of all of these craft. And you see they all basically have the same shape. But, uh, but lately, as we've got, talked about newer aircraft, we start talking about different wing shapes. And that's what this is. Like this is a cutout of the Concorde. And you see the shape of its wings. Those are called delta wings. Because delta, I'll draw right down here, is a Greek letter. And it's shaped just like a triangle. So delta letter, delta wings. And one of the reasons that newer, faster aircraft have these swept back wings is that it gets them out of the way of the shock waves. Andrew was talking about shock waves before and the speed of sound and sonic booms. So like if this airplane's driving through the air, then what happens, what, what comes off of the nose of the airplane is a wake, just like what comes off of boats. And it looks like this. 
right? So you can see that the wings are out of the way of the shock wave. But if you look at older supersonic aircraft, if we go to the first one, the Bell X-1, well, I have a cutout right here, you can see it has straight wings. And they decided to do that, even though they'd done a lot of research on what kinds of wings to put on it. And ultimately, they decided to do it, but look what happens to this one. If you have the shock wave coming off because you're flying faster than the speed of sound, then that shock wave slams into the wing. So that really slows your airplanes down. If you keep driving past the speed of sound, slamming into the shock waves, it's like it keeps hitting your wings and it slows your airplanes down and it's not very efficient. So a lot of newer aircraft have these swept back wings and you see them on jetliners and also the Space Shuttle Enterprise. So with that, maybe Clay can tell us about the Shuttle Enterprise, our last airplane in the series today. Clay, take it away. Hi, my name's Clay McKenney, and my plane is the Space Shuttle Enterprise. It has a wingspan of 78 feet, and its length, that's 122 feet. Height, that's 57 feet. And now let's get a closer look at the Space Shuttle Enterprise, over and out. Now, I'm back at the Space Shuttle Enterprise, and I've been joined by Valerie Neal. She is a space historian. Hi. Valerie Neal, here are a couple things that I know about the Space Shuttle. All right. Um, that it's pretty much like an airplane, and it is its tiles, and it had a total of 13 flights, was it? Absolutely. Enterprise flew 13 times, but not in space. This space shuttle is a test vehicle and it flew in the atmosphere only. And it never did get to go into space. But it's still a very valuable spacecraft because it was the very first space shuttle ever made. Have you been this close to a space shuttle before? No. What's your good. first impression of it? It's bigger than I thought it would be because on TV they make it look smaller and it's just really huge. It really is huge and that's what everybody says and as long as it is you think this must be all full of uh, rooms where the people live and work while they're in space. Is yes. that what that is all about? No. Um, actually like you said for NASA the Enterprise it's really just cargo space for like space um, space telescopes and things right. like that. You have really done your homework because most of the shuttle is very much like an 18-wheeler truck. It carries lots of big pieces of equipment in it. In fact, it can carry equipment the size of school buses. And the crew only live up here in the front part where the cockpit is and a little room under the cockpit that's about the size of maybe a utility room or a laundry room in your house. Now you mentioned something about the, sh the tiles on the shuttle. Um, yeah. What do you notice about these tiles that are marked out here on the shuttle? They look like they're foam or something from their texture. Yeah, and you'll notice there are black ones and there are white ones. Um, the shuttle is covered in tiles so it can be reusable. Let's go up here where we can get a closer look. The, t the tiles are actually heat shielding and they protect the shuttle when it comes back from space. And these black tiles cover the hottest parts of the shuttle and the white tiles cover the cooler parts of the shuttle. But these tiles aren't actually real uh, because the Enterprise didn't fly in space. It didn't need real tiles. It just had 
uh, pretend tiles, fake tiles. And we're in the business right now of cleaning the tiles because over the years while Enterprise was in storage, they got very dusty. So uh, do you want to know how to clean tiles? Yeah, but I have a question first. Oh, okay. How many tiles does the Enterprise have? How many tiles? How many would you guess it might have? Maybe 5,000. 5,000 tiles? No, it's more than that. It's 30,000. Whoa. Let's meet Ann. Uh, Ann McCombs, who's a restoration Hi, specialist. Ann. Hi, Clay. How are you doing this morning? Good. Great. You uh, understand you'd like to uh, get up close and personal and clean a few of these tiles. Yeah. Well, as you can see, they're dirty and straight, so uh, let's Here, get I'll going with you, it. I'll hold your cards while you... Um, All right. While you get there's, ready there's a to nice clean. pair of rubber gloves. This is just ordinary household detergent, but um, if you have your hands in it all day, your fingers will get all pruny. So you probably like to keep them clean and dry and uh, not get all pruny. And these tiles have gotten dirty over the years while the vehicle was in storage. So we're cleaning them in order to just clean off dust and clean off anything else that might have landed on the vehicle to pr better protect it so we can keep it for a long, long time. We want this shuttle to be here when you have grandchildren. And okay. we also want it to look pretty. Okay, let's squeeze out that piece of gray scrubby there and put a couple of squirts of uh, soap on it uh, just to get it uh, ready to clean. Okay. And All how right. about it? Let's see, uh, this looks nice and streaky right in here. You'll also find that the paint itself has gotten kind of um, chalky over the years. That is, the top layer is starting to turn to powder. So that'll come off as you scrub. So you can scrub pretty firmly on that, get it good and clean. And thank you for this lesson. And Clay, thank you for helping preserve the space shuttle. You bet. We're going to go back to Blake now, who has a very special guest. Okay. Thank you all very much for joining us today. And like, but if you liked this electronic field trip, we do do more. Paul State University on May 11th and 13th is going to be hosting another one on capital deliberation. So to join me in Kelsey today, we have Congressman Mike Pence from Indiana. Congressman, thanks for joining us. Thank you both. It's exciting to be with you today and exciting to have you in Washington, D.C., especially you, Kelsey. So like Kelsey, it's like, this is your congressman. Did you vote for him? I wish. You wish? Yeah, you're not old enough to vote. All right, so like, if this is your congressman, like, what do you want to know? He's right here, ask him. Um, I understand that the next electronic field trip is uh, has to do with the Congress and legislative process. Um, what do you like being about a congressman? I'll tell you, Kelsey, I, it was always my dream as a little boy growing up in southern Indiana to someday serve here in Washington, D.C., and so it's, it's the thrill of my life to be here to work with my colleagues, uh, Democrats and Republicans, on major issues, foreign and domestic, and, and also to work with the President of the United States on, on developing an agenda that will move our nation forward, and especially in these difficult times as we're surrounded by so many warplanes here, doing the kind of things that are necessary to protect our nation in these uh, difficult days. Well, Congressman, like for this next electronic field trip in May, Capital Deliberations, it's like I understand the students will be going to Washington. What would you hope students would take away from an experience like that? Well, Blake, our, our fondest hope uh, with the, the, the Capital Deliberations field trip on Capitol Hill is that the students all across America, many millions of which are looking in today, would, would leave that experience with a sense that Washington belongs to them. Uh, that as we go through the process of a hearing where students will actually, Kelsey, be asking me, your congressman, questions about a very important issue facing the nation, uh, we'll be uh, in a position to uh, have to kind of be on the spot like we are each and every day in the hearings on Capitol Hill. Uh, we'll take all of that live onto the internet to show uh, students exactly how Washington works. But, but Blake, as I said before, our heartfelt hope is that students would leave that experience, that digital field trip, with a sense that this government is their government. Good stuff, Congressman. Like Kelsey, what else do you want to know? Just, why do you think these planes are so cool? <laughs> well, I got to tell you, uh, Kelsey, if I wasn't a congressman, if I could wave a magic wand, I'd either be a pilot like my wife Karen, 
or I'd be an astronaut. So coming to the Smithsonian here and seeing these wonderful aircraft that talk about the 100 year history of flight that we're celebrating this year is just a thrill to me because I can live in my imagination that dream of being a pilot and an astronaut. Congressman, thank you so much for joining us today. And that next electronic field trip is particularly important because like today, people from all 50 states have been watching this broadcast. So hopefully for the next one too. So with that, we want to thank all of you for watching and especially the Best Buy Children's Foundation for funding this and making it all possible. Also the Smithsonian Institution, the National Air and Space Museum, most of our employers, all of us here, uh, Bob and me and Andrew and Margie and Christine and Valerie, thank you for coming and also Ball State for making all of this possible. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye-bye, everybody.